David Dorsey delves into the nuanced theological debate concerning the relevance of Old Testament, OT law for New Testament, NT Christians. This intricate issue centres on deciphering which of the 613 Mosaic laws remain pertinent for contemporary believers, a question that has sparked varied interpretations and opinions within Christian scholarship. The inconsistency and subjectivity in selecting which laws are deemed normative are evident in the varying approaches to the Ten Commandments, where some commandments are universally upheld, while others, like the Fourth, are often reinterpreted or adjusted. Also, Dorsey emphasises the selective application of laws concerning morality, diet and punishment, demonstrating a pattern of picking and choosing, based on cultural and historical context. This subjectivity is further complicated by the NT's seemingly contradictory stance. On one side, texts such as Acts 15 and Galatians 4, 5 accentuate a departure from the strict observance of the Mosaic law for Gentile Christians, advocating for a new covenant of grace and faith, detached from the ceremonial and ritualistic aspects of the law. Conversely, the law is upheld for its moral and spiritual value in other passages with Paul and other NT writers integrating specific OT laws into their teachings, thereby endorsing a continuity of the law's ethical and moral imperatives. Throughout church history, this debate has persisted, giving rise to a spectrum of doctrinal positions ranging from minimal to substantial applicability of the OT law to Christian life. Dorsey's examination affirms the complexity of interpreting and integrating biblical law into contemporary Christian practice, revealing a theological issue that is deeply rooted in historical, cultural, and scriptural analysis. Moreover, Marcion, a prominent second century theologian, is best known for his radical interpretation of Christian scripture, which led to views considered heretical by mainstream Christianity. His theological stance was deeply rooted in Gnosticism, a belief system that asserted esoteric knowledge as the path to spiritual enlightenment. Marcion's unique perspective on the Christian canon led him to draw a stark distinction between the God depicted in the Old Testament and the God revealed through Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Marcion viewed the OT God as a strict, punitive deity, vastly inferior to the benevolent, forgiving good God portrayed in the NT. This dichotomous view fueled his controversial decision to exclude the entire OT and its associated Jewish laws from his version of the Christian canon. He deemed the moral and ethical teachings of the OT to be incompatible with the more compassionate and grace-filled teachings of Christ in the NT. For Martian, the strict legalism and the perceived vindictiveness of the OT God did not align with the message of love and redemption he found in the teachings of Jesus. The impact of Marcion's thoughts provoked significant discourse within early Christian circles, prompting church leaders and scholars to more rigorously define the contents of the Christian canon and the relationship between the OT and NT. Scholars such as G. D. Fee and D. Stewart have highlighted the importance of understanding the Bible holistically, recognizing the continuity and interconnection between the OT and NT. Furthermore, Marcion's teachings and their implications have been the subject of extensive scholarly analysis, with notable contributions from A. von Harnack, E. C. Blackman and J. Knox. These studies have been indispensable in understanding the historical and theological context of Marcion's work, shedding light on the complexities of early Christian theological development and the process of canon formation. Furthermore, dispensationalism is a theological framework that interprets the Bible as a series of progressive revelations or dispensations from God, each with specific divine expectations and instructions. Proponents of this view, like Chafer and Ryrie, argue that God has interacted with humanity in distinct ways throughout different historical periods. This approach particularly indicates the transition from the Old Testament period, known as the Dispensation of Law, spanning Exodus to Malachi, to the New Testament era, termed the dispensation of grace. Within this framework, the laws and directives given to the people of Israel, including the Ten Commandments and other Mosaic laws, are seen as specific to the dispensation of law. Chafer maintains that only the parts of the scripture that directly address Christians 
under the dispensation of grace, should be considered applicable to them. This perspective implies that the obligations and commands given in the previous dispensations are not binding on Christians today. The essence of this view is that the arrival of Christ and the establishment of the New Testament era introduced a new set of divine principles, rendering the previous ones obsolete for Christians. Ryrie, reinforcing this viewpoint, specifically challenges the common division of the Mosaic law into moral, ceremonial and judicial categories. He contends that Christ's teachings and sacrifice abrogated the entire body of the Mosaic law, including the moral laws encapsulated in the Ten Commandments. For dispensationalists, the guiding principle for Christians is not the Mosaic law, but the law of Christ, which signifies the teachings and commands of Jesus as depicted in the New Testament. This shift marks a radical departure from the obligations of the previous dispensation, pointing out the distinct and separate nature of the dispensations in God's overarching plan for humanity. In addition, Dorsey dives into covenant theology within the Reformed tradition, presenting it as a counterpoint to dispensationalism. This theology reiterates a profound continuity across the biblical narrative, viewing history as a singular, unbroken covenant of grace from Abraham and Moses to the present church era. In this framework, the church is perceived as the spiritual successor of Israel, inheriting the obligations and promises of the Mosaic covenant. This perspective suggests that Christians live under a renewed covenant rather than an entirely new one, implying a continuation rather than a departure from the Old Testament covenants. In discussing the Mosaic law, Dorsey categorizes the 613 commandments into moral, ceremonial, and civic laws. Civic laws, tailored for a specific historical theocratic society, and ceremonial laws, which symbolically foreshadowed Christ's advent, are deemed obsolete in the post-Christ era. This obsolescence is supported by scriptural references in Acts, Galatians, and Hebrews, which suggest these laws served a temporary purpose that concluded with Christ's coming. The enduring element of the Mosaic law, according to covenant theology, is the moral laws, such as the Ten Commandments and the imperative to love God and one's neighbour. These moral codes are viewed as timeless, applying to all believers across all ages. Further, the discussion incorporates insights from theologians like C.C. C. Ryrie, repeating a nuanced understanding of the continuity and discontinuity of the Old Testament laws. While the Old Testament laws as a whole are not binding on Christians, the moral imperatives as part of the law of Christ persist. This perspective underlines that the law of Christ encompasses both new teachings and enduring moral principles from the Mosaic law, thus creating a bridge between the covenants and aligning Christian ethical conduct with a broader historically rooted moral framework. Dorsey supports these views with references to significant reformed systematic theologies indicating a well-established scholarly consensus within this theological tradition. Besides, Seventh-day Adventism is a Christian denomination that places significant emphasis on the continuity and universality of the Ten Commandments as a moral and spiritual guideline for all believers. Central to their doctrine is the belief that these commandments, given by God at Sinai, are not only historical artefacts, but are perpetually binding and relevant. This perspective is rooted in a covenantal understanding of Scripture, where God's agreements and laws are seen as enduring commitments rather than transient instructions. Adventists specifically underscore the consistency required in upholding the Decalogue. They debate that accepting the Ten Commandments while rejecting or modifying the Fourth Commandment, which mandates the observance of the Sabbath on the seventh day, Saturday, is an inconsistency that dilutes the integrity and unity of the entire code. For them, the Sabbath is not just a ceremonial observance, but a perpetual moral imperative that reinforces the rhythm of rest and worship, as established at creation. Additionally, the Adventist adherence to the biblical dietary laws further exemplifies their commitment to the holistic application of biblical principles. They believe that these dietary guidelines, also issued at Sinai, are not merely cultural or temporal, but are divine instructions intended for human well-being and spiritual clarity. By observing these dietary laws, Seventh-day Adventists aim to honour their bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit, 
and to live in harmony with the principles of health and stewardship outlined in Scripture. In essence, Seventh-day Adventism advocates for a faith practice that is deeply rooted in Scripture, emphasizing the enduring nature of God's commandments and the importance of a consistent, holistic approach to spiritual obedience and lifestyle. Their commitment to both the Sabbath and the dietary laws reflects a broader theological stance that values the continuity of God's covenant and the relevance of his commandments in contemporary Christian life. Moreover, Christian Reconstructionism, also recognized as theonomy or the Chalcedon School, is a theological perspective rooted in Reformed theology. It posits a radical return to the Old Testament laws, advocating for their application in modern-day governance. This movement diverges significantly from the mainstream Reformed theology by insisting that all biblical laws, including civic regulations found in the Old Testament, should be universally applied and enforced, not just the moral laws. Proponents like Rush Dooney, Barnson and North dispute that many Reformed theologians have mistakenly disregarded the judicial laws outlined in the Old Testament. They argue that while the ceremonial laws were indeed fulfilled through the life and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the civic laws outlined in the books of Moses remain pertinent and binding. Christian Reconstructionists hold a firm belief that these laws are not just historical artefacts, but are intended for governance in all societies and at all times. They advocate for a societal framework where civil magistrates enforce these biblical laws, including those that mandate capital punishment for a variety of offences that are largely viewed as archaic or overly severe by contemporary standards. These offences include not only crimes like murder, but also acts such as blasphemy, apostasy, idolatry, witchcraft, homosexuality, Sabbath-breaking, and even what is termed as incorrigibility in children. This interpretation of biblical law represents a radical shift from the conventional Christian understanding of the Old Testament's role in modern life. Christian Reconstructionism seeks not just to influence individual morality, but to reshape entire legal and governmental systems, according to the judicial and civic laws of the Old Testament, proposing a societal structure deeply intertwined with ancient biblical mandates. Furthermore, Herbert W. Armstrong, founder of the Worldwide Church of God, articulated a distinctive theological stance regarding the relationship between Old Testament laws and contemporary Christian practices. Within the broader Christian community, which encompasses a diverse array of perspectives on the relevance of Old Testament law, Armstrong's position is notable for advocating a particularly high level of continuity. He contends that, contrary to the views held by many other Christian groups, the advent of Christ did not render the majority of these laws obsolete. Rather, only a specific subset, those pertaining to sacrifices, has been fulfilled and thus no longer applies. Armstrong's argument pivots around the idea that the fulfillment of the sacrificial laws through Jesus Christ doesn't extend to other Old Testament commandments, which he believes remain binding for spiritual Israel. This term, as used by Armstrong, conceptualizes Christians as the inheritors and continuers of the covenant between God and the Israelites, thus subject to many of the same laws and practices that defined ancient Israelite society. Key among these retained practices are the observance of the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week, adherence to dietary restrictions laid out in Levitical law, and the celebration of Jewish feast days and holy occasions, elements that are more typically associated with Jewish religious practice than with mainstream Christianity. In addition, Armstrong maintains that certain ceremonial laws, beyond the abrogated sacrificial ordinances, should still be observed by Christians. These positions place Armstrong and the Worldwide Church of God in a relatively unique space within Christian thought, advocating for a form of practice that deeply integrates elements of Jewish law and tradition into Christian life. This approach accentuates a vision of Christianity that sees less of a rupture and more of a continuation from Old to New Testament teachings, suggesting a complex interplay between adherence to tradition and the transformative impact of Christ's mission. Through this lens, Armstrong's teachings affirm a continuity that not only bridges the two testaments, but also invites a reconsideration of how Christians relate to and interpret ancient biblical laws 
in the light of Christ's sacrifice. Further, Dorsey presents a thoughtful interpretation of the complex relationship between Old Testament laws and their applicability to New Testament Christians. He proposes a balanced viewpoint, suggesting that while the 613 covenantal laws given to Israel at Sinai are not legally binding for Christians, they remain instructive and valuable in a spiritual and ethical sense. This perspective seeks to bridge the gap between two often conflicting views by asserting the continued relevance of these laws for teaching and reflection without imposing them as direct legal obligations on believers in the new covenant established through Christ. Dorsey carefully navigates the textual evidence to support his thesis, pointing to the NT writer's clear stance that the old covenant stipulations have been superseded by a new covenant. This is not merely a renewed contract, but a fundamentally different agreement, inaugurated by Jesus, which is described as superior and better. This new covenant comes with its own set of directives and principles, tailored to the life of the Christian community, including practices such as the Lord's Supper, baptism, the selection of church elders, and ethical living under secular authorities. Central to Dorsey's argument is the recognition that the new covenant has rendered the old covenant's laws obsolete, as explicitly stated in texts like Hebrews 8.13. This obsolescence is not only a matter of legal requirement, but also considers the practicality and applicability of OT laws to the lives of NT Christians. Many of these laws, deeply intertwined with the specific cultural, religious and civic circumstances of ancient Israel, cannot be directly or meaningfully applied in a Christian context. By advocating for a view of OT laws as pedagogically valuable, yet not legally binding for Christians, Dorsey offers a path forward that respects the theological integrity and historical context of both Testaments. This approach encourages believers to dig into the OT with the aim of deriving moral and spiritual insights, while acknowledging the transformative impact of Christ's new covenant, which establishes a distinct and guiding framework for Christian faith and practice. Through this lens, the OT's regulations are seen not as outdated legalistic requirements, but as a rich source of ethical reflection and spiritual growth within the boundless grace of the New Covenant. Besides, Dorsey's critical analysis highlights the specific geographical and climatic context of the corpus of laws found primarily within the biblical texts, indicating their tailored application to the Southern Levant's unique environment. This region, characterized by its distinct climate and topography, dictated unique agricultural and societal practices that are reflected in these ancient statutes. Examples such as the peculiar instruction on the offering of the fat tail from a breed of sheep indigenous to Palestine serve to illustrate the unfeasibility of adhering to these regulations outside their original context, where such animal breeds do not exist. Further unraveling the corpus, Dorsey maintains the detailed regulations surrounding agricultural activities, from the cultivation of the Mediterranean olive tree to the complex processes involved in Emma wheat production. These instructions are deeply intertwined with the Levantine climate and agricultural cycles, presuming a familiarity with local flora and fauna, alongside specific seasonal timelines. Similarly, the prescribed use of animals native to the region including the Near Eastern ox and the Syrian black goat, alongside dietary restrictions on a myriad of animals, some of which remain unidentified by modern scholars, pointed out the localised application of these laws. Additionally, Dorsey discusses climatically constrained laws that are synchronised with the Levantine calendar, such as the timing of harvests and religious feasts. These time-bound commands further reiterate the impracticality of transplanting such statutes to regions with disparate climates and agricultural cycles, such as the Southern Hemisphere or tropical islands. In sum, Dorsey's analysis proposes that the inherent regional specificity of these ancient laws suggests they were not intended as a universally applicable legal framework for the Christian Church, which transcends geographical and environmental boundaries. This perspective challenges the relevance and applicability of the corpus's stipulations to a globalised Christian community. Distributed across a diversity of ecological and climatic contexts, far removed from the ancient Levantine setting. Also, Dorsey's critical examination of the scriptural corpus 
offers a nuanced understanding of its role in the ancient Near East, repeating its design to specifically govern the lives, customs and institutions of the Israelite society within that particular cultural milieu. He debates that the laws and stipulations found within these ancient texts are deeply rooted in the societal practices, norms and conditions prevalent among the ancient Israelites, making them highly relevant and applicable to that context, but considerably less so outside of it. One of Dorsey's pivotal illustrations of this cultural specificity is the commandment in Deuteronomy 22, 8 to build a parapet around one's roof, a requirement that aligns with the architectural and social practice of utilising flat roofs as spaces for hospitality in ancient Israel. This regulation, while meaningful within its original context, would seem obsolete in societies where architectural designs and social customs differ drastically. Dorsey meticulously catalogues various other stipulations to underline the point that the corpus was not a universal legal and moral guide, but was instead intricately tailored to the ancient Near Eastern way of life. These include, among others, the detailed management of slavery, nuanced laws around polygamy and leverate marriage, the concept of bride price, moha, regulations on concubinage, practices surrounding the kinsman redeemer, and the peculiar custom of garment pledging. Besides, he examines societal structures and norms such as the application of stoning, the practice of swearing oaths in the name of the deity, the peculiarities of hereditary kingship, the administrative use of city gates, the architectural details of stone houses with plaster interiors, and the protocol for blood avengement. Dorsey's comprehensive list serves to illustrate the depth of cultural entrenchment of these laws, underscoring their functionality and significance within the ancient Near Eastern context. This analysis invites a reconsideration of the corpus's applicability and relevance across different cultures and epochs, proposing that its primary purpose was to regulate life within the specific societal, cultural and historical confines of ancient Israel. As such, Dorsey provides a compelling argument for the contextual interpretation of these ancient texts, reinforcing the view that their full significance and intended application can only be appreciated when viewed through the lens of the ancient Near Eastern culture. Moreover, Dorsey's examination of the Mosaic corpus within its original ancient Near Eastern A&E, context provides a critical understanding of the specificity and applicability of these laws beyond their time and geographical location. By focusing on the religious and cultural milieu of Canaan, where these laws were first established, Dorsey sheds light on the complexity surrounding the transferability of religious directives across different cultures and epochs. He emphasises how certain practices and regulations, deeply ingrained in the Israelite religious identity, are rendered obsolete or incomprehensible in differing contexts, particularly for New Testament Christians. A quintessential example Dorsey provides is the regulations concerning the priestly ephod, found in Exodus and Leviticus. In the ANE context, the ephod was not only well known, but held significant religious function and symbolism. The intricacies of its design, purpose and use were intimately tied to the Israelites' religious practices and understanding of divine interaction. However, for believers today, particularly those removed from this cultural and religious setting, the concept of an ephod, much less its specific requirements and significance, is largely unknown. This disconnection challenges the direct application of these laws in a modern religious context. Dorsey extends this observation to other elements of the Mosaic law, such as the construction and operation of cultic sanctuaries and altars, the formulation and use of cultic incense, various forms of sacrificial offerings, and the regulations surrounding religious vows and votive offerings. Furthermore, he discusses the culturally specific institutions of the Nazi Rite vow, prophets, and cultic priests as examples of practices deeply embedded within the ANE religious framework. Through these illustrations, Dorsey not only accentuates the cultural and temporal specificity of the Mosaic laws, but also invites readers to consider the broader implications of interpreting ancient religious texts. His analysis suggests that understanding the original context and intended audience of these laws is crucial for discerning their relevance and application in contemporary religious practice, 
This approach encourages a thoughtful engagement with religious texts, recognising the significance of historical, cultural and societal contexts in shaping religious norms and practices. In addition, Dorsey's analysis of the code of laws given by God to the ancient Israelites meticulously outlines their specific function within the context of a defined sovereign nation. These laws were comprehensive, meticulously designed to guide Israel's political, social, judicial and religious life. The laws encompassed a wide range of duties and regulations, including the selection and behaviour of a king, maintenance of tribal divisions and organisational systems, appointments of judges and officials, and protocols for Levitical priests. They extended further to outline the establishment and purpose of cities of refuge, the intricacies of the nation's judicial system, and detailed foreign policies towards neighbouring nations and peoples. Furthermore, the laws prescribed the conduct of warfare, treatment of captive women, and the harem procedures, a practice of devoting things or people to God, often by totally destroying them as seen against the Amalekites and Canaanites. These detailed directives were not merely religious or moral in nature, but were inherently political, serving to regulate virtually every aspect of life within the geographical and political boundaries of Israel. Dorsey affirms a crucial distinction between ancient Israel and the contemporary church. While Israel was a politically and geographically defined nation, bound by these laws, the church is a global community of believers, not confined to any single political or geographical identity. This fundamental difference is pivotal in understanding the non-applicability of Israel's nation-specific laws to the church. The church, scattered amongst various nations, is called to respect and comply with the established governmental and legal frameworks of their respective countries, as instructed by New Covenant teachings, such as those found in Romans 13. This shift from a nation-specific, comprehensive legal system to a more universally applicable moral and ethical guidance asserts the transition from Old Testament law to New Covenant faith for Christians worldwide, illustrating a transformation in the understanding and application of divine law across different covenantal contexts. Further, Dorsey's examination of the Sinaitic Law Code profoundly critiques its direct applicability to the modern Christian church shedding light on the contextual and cultural specificity of these ancient regulations. Central to his argument is the assertion that the vast majority of the 613 stipulations found within the Code were intricately linked to a cultic regime that has since been rendered obsolete with the advent of the Church. Key elements of this regime include the tabernacle, the Levitical Aaronic priesthood, and an elaborate sacrificial system, all of which are no longer practiced by Christians. This foundational change fundamentally affects the relevancy of numerous laws, with Dorsey highlighting that the stipulations governing animal sacrifices, priestly duties, and the use of the tabernacle, among others, are now unfulfillable for believers. Dorsey meticulously disputes that the geographical and cultural constraints of these laws, designed for the West Semitic inhabitants of the Southern Levant, inherently limit their applicability. The dramatic shift in context from then to the global and diverse setting of contemporary Christianity makes it evident that these laws were not intended as a universal legal code for all followers of Christ. Nevertheless, the New Testament does not categorically dismiss all aspects of the Sinaitic corpus. While it declares the sacrificial system obsolete, it upholds the essence of moral laws, such as the Ten Commandments, with a notable emphasis on loving God and one's neighbour. This tension between the obsolescence of particular rights and the continuity of foundational moral principles indicates a complex relationship between Old Testament laws and New Testament teachings. However, Dorsey critically evaluates the proposition that a specific subset of moral laws within the corpus remains normative for Christians, a view advocated by some covenant theologians. Although recognising the intention to honour the enduring moral imperatives found within the Bible, he concludes that such a position lacks robust biblical substantiation. The effort to single out timeless moral obligations, while laudable, does not convincingly account for the holistic transformation of the covenant community's relationship with God's law, as illustrated in the NT narrative.
Dorsey's analysis thus invites a deeper reconsideration of how Christians engage with and interpret the legal and moral frameworks of their faith heritage in light of the comprehensive narrative of scripture. Besides, Dorsey's analysis critically addresses the contention surrounding the tripartite division of the law, an idea prevalent in modern Christian theology that discerns between moral, ceremonial and civil categories of laws within the biblical text. However, this division doesn't find its roots in biblical scripture or early rabbinic literature, suggesting its origins in later Christian theological developments rather than ancient Judaic understanding or practice. Scholars like Kaiser have been pivotal in questioning this division, maintaining that such categorization lacks historical and textual substantiation. The discussion brings to light the viewpoints of critics like Ryrie and Wenham, who regard the tripartite division as both arbitrary and artificial, arguing against its validity by pointing out its absence in New Testament scripture and its inconsistency with Jewish perspectives on the law. Central to Dorsey's examination is the emphasis on Jesus's teachings, which align with the views presented in the Old Testament, privileging the overarching principles and purposes of the law over the rigid adherence to its individual stipulations and the oral traditions that surround them. Jesus's differentiation between weightier and lighter matters doesn't introduce a categorization of laws, but reiterates the importance of internalizing the law's foundational principles of justice, faithfulness, and mercy, as evidenced by the prophetic traditions of Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, and Micah. Additionally, the New Testament's portrayal of the law as a unified entity repeats a holistic understanding and obligation towards it. Authors like Paul and James articulate an all-or-nothing approach to the law, suggesting that adherence to or violation of one part implicates the entire law. Also, this perspective is elaborated by Paul's description of the law as a tutor leading to Christ, marking a shift in the believer's relationship to the law post-Christ, suggesting a completion rather than a continued segmented adherence. Overall, Dorsey's discussion challenges the modern theological compartmentalization of biblical laws, advocating for an interpretation that sees them as a unified whole, underlining their overarching goals rather than their categorical distinctions. Moreover, Dorsey critically examines the traditional classification of biblical laws into moral, ceremonial, and civic categories, challenging the validity of this categorization. He contends that all 613 laws inherently embody moral and ethical principles, questioning the distinction between so-called ceremonial or civic laws and those deemed moral. Dorsey underscores the problematic nature of labeling certain laws as moral while relegating others, suggesting that such distinctions are methodologically flawed. In his analysis, Dorsey focuses on the contextual nature of several commandments, illustrating how they are deeply ingrained in the specific cultural, historical, and geographical backdrop of ancient Israel. He scrutinizes the fourth, fifth, and tenth commandments, noting that their provisions and language are tailored to the societal structure, practices, and norms of the ancient Near East including references to slavery, city gates, and theocratic governance. For instance, the commandment to honour one's parents is intrinsically linked to the well-being and longevity in the specific land given by God to the Israelites, reflecting a geographically and culturally bounded promise. Furthermore, Dorsey emphasises that even the command to be holy is not free from cultural particularities, being intertwined with practices like Sabbath observance, sacrificial rites and clothing regulations, he postulates that the designation of certain laws as moral might be more a matter of textual presentation, lacking explicit time-bound or culturally specific language, rather than a reflection of their universal moral significance. This observation leads him to question whether the current categorization of moral laws is more a consequence of literary happenstance than a deliberate theological distinction challenging the traditional understanding and interpretation of biblical laws. In addition, Dorsey presents a compelling argument regarding the application of Mosaic laws to New Testament Christians, challenging traditional categorizations of these laws into moral, ceremonial, or civil groups. He debates that such categorization is not only unnecessary, but also diminishes the comprehensive value of the laws. 
Dorsey proposes that all 613 Mosaic laws, despite not being legally binding for Christians, possess profound moral and spiritual significance. According to Dorsey, these laws should not be viewed merely as ancient rules, but as a rich source of divine revelation and moral instruction. He cites 2 Timothy 3.16, accentuating that all scripture, including these laws, is God-breathed and beneficial for teaching, correction, and righteous living. This perspective positions the laws as integral to understanding theological truths, rectifying wrongdoings, and guiding personal morality. Paul's writings further reinforce this view. Dorsey affirms that Paul regards the Mosaic laws with utmost respect, recognizing them as expressions of God's righteous standards. They are deemed good, holy, and spiritual, serving not just as rules, but as reflections of God's character and will. Paul asserts that each law, beyond its literal command, contributes to the overarching principle of loving one's neighbor, encapsulating the essence of Christian ethical living. Dorsey advocates for a theocentric hermeneutical approach to these laws, urging Christians to interpret them through a lens that focuses on understanding God's nature and intentions. This approach involves recognizing each law as a divine disclosure, revealing aspects of God's character and priorities. By studying and internalizing the moral and spiritual lessons embedded in these laws, Christians can enhance their understanding of God and align their lives more closely with His will, leading to a more profound and authentic Christian experience. Last but not least, Dorsey presents a nuanced, theocentric approach to interpreting Old Testament OT laws, providing a comprehensive framework that bridges the historical and theological context of ancient Israel with contemporary Christian life. Dorsey's methodology is a four-step process, beginning with the acknowledgement that OT laws were part of a unique covenant between God and Israel, positioning contemporary readers as observers, much like understanding a message intended for a different audience in another era. This perspective is crucial in avoiding anachronistic interpretations or misapplications of these ancient texts. The second step involves a meticulous analysis of the law's original intent, urging a direct engagement with the text to understand the motives and purposes behind its issuance by God. This approach discourages the practice of allegorizing or spiritualizing the text, which can often lead to a deviation from the law's primary intent and significance. The third step, shifts focus to theological reflection, contemplating what each law reveals about God's character, values, and expectations. This introspection provides profound insights into God's personality and his relationship with humanity, transcending the historical and cultural specifics of the laws themselves. Besides, Dorsey advocates for the practical application of these theological insights in a contemporary Christian context. This involves translating the principles and values underlying the OT laws into modern-day practices, aligning them with the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. By following this method, Dorsey disputes that Christians can faithfully fulfill the essence and spirit of the OT laws. This process not only honours the historical and cultural context of these ancient texts, but also allows for their transformative power to be realised in the lives of modern believers fostering a deeper and more holistic understanding of the Bible and its teachings. In conclusion, Dorsey provides an insightful analysis of the complex issue concerning the relevance of Old Testament laws for New Testament Christians. He navigates the nuanced theological debate on the applicability of the 613 Mosaic laws, addressing the inconsistency and subjectivity in selecting which laws are deemed normative in Christian practice. Dorsey observes the selective adherence to laws related to morality, diet and punishment, highlighting the varying treatment of the Ten Commandments, where some, like the Fourth Commandment, are often reinterpreted or adjusted. Additionally, Dorsey examines the NT texts, noting a dichotomy where certain passages, such as Acts 15 and Galatians 4, 5, advocate for a departure from strict Mosaic observance, promoting a new covenant of grace and faith detached from ceremonial aspects of the law. In contrast, other texts uphold the law's moral and spiritual value, with NT writers incorporating specific OT laws into their teachings, suggesting a continuity of ethical and moral imperatives. 
Also, Dorsey discusses various theological perspectives, including Marcion's radical interpretation, dispensationalism's idea of distinct divine interactions in different eras, and covenant theology's emphasis on a singular covenant of grace across biblical history. He also touches on Seventh-day Adventism's emphasis on the continuity of the Ten Commandments and Christian Reconstructionism's advocacy for the application of all biblical laws in modern governance. Lastly, Dorsey's work indicates the complexity of interpreting and integrating biblical law into contemporary Christian practice. His examination is deeply rooted in historical, cultural and scriptural analysis, revealing a theological issue that remains integral to understanding the evolving relationship between the covenants and the diverse approaches to biblical law in Christian theology.